good y'all it's your boy ross back at it again with another video so we're gonna be checking out how bad was triple h reign of terror from 2002 through 2005 now i think a lot of us can agree that when triple h was head of evolution around that period on raw i'm be honest with you <laughs> it just seemed like the, the championship the world heavyweight championship was not leaving triple h waste at least not for a while like you would think people would have a lengthy title reign when they when it came to facing triple h nope it, that wasn't the case prime example goldberg there's no reason why goldberg should have only had this championship belt for like maybe one month that's all he had it for and then after that he lost it right back to triple h again and was never able to regain it um it's just one of those things where triple h had a lot of power back then definitely used a lot of politicking and uh he pretty much had the world heavyweight championship hostage that, that's literally what it was it wasn't until it was batista's moment that they kind of let go of the world heavyweight championship they kind of took it away from him but outside of that he had that championship on lock so we're gonna check this out this should be a good video man super kick studios if you haven't subscribed to him i don't even know i haven't subscribed to him let me subscribe to him right now man dude makes some very informative content when it comes to wrestling and anything wrestling related so i already subscribed to him hit the post notification for his channel so y'all go ahead and do that i will link the, the original video down in the description below and uh let's get right into this one should be a good one wrestling and more specifically the wwe one of the most dry and downright damaging periods is known as the reign of terror a time frame between 2002 and 2005 where Monday Night Raw was basically the Triple H show. He'd Pretty be littered much. throughout the show in multiple segments, oftentimes would start off Raw with a promo that didn't really add any value to ongoing storylines and was just filler. And the worst part was that he would defeat opponents when the other person should have came out on top. Mm -hmm. The Reign of Terror was one which Triple H had a stranglehold on the World Heavyweight Championship, and it's seen as a period where people just switched off from watching Raw. But was it really that bad? Well, lucky for you, I strapped my nipples to the horse like Dolph Ziggler in Silent Library, and what I tortured fuck? myself by watching every single match every single segment and the entire Damn. reign of terror do not do this unless you want to torture yourself you have this video Jesus. you know as a kid i was watching that is torturous you watched every triple h promo you know how he be drawing out his words <laughs> you watched all that jesus man and no disrespect to triple h man he, he's he is He's done amazing work in NXT. Uh, he has really revitalized a lot of people's careers. And, you know, he's really put some some more talent on the screen, like in the spotlight. Unfortunately, Vince just swept that all under the rug. Triple H has done some amazing work off camera. But at this time and period, 2002 to 2005, yeah, man, he... He had the, the championship scene on lock. And I thought that Triple H was just really good. That's why he always won. And now that I'm a little bit older, nope, I shovel. understand the other side of wrestling. And well, let's just say that I never want to hear Motorhead ever again. We begin this story in the year 2002, where Triple H returned from a quad injury. By summer of that year, he became the number one contender for the undisputed WWE title held by Brock Lesnar. Only issue is that Brock Lesnar signed a deal to become exclusive to SmackDown, so Raw was left without a world title. And Raw GM Eric Bischoff just went, yo, screw it. I'm just going to hand it over to the number one contender. Mm -hmm. No tournament, no big match, nothing. And so Triple H was awarded the World Heavyweight title and the reign of terror had begun. On that night, Ric Flair came out yelling at Triple H about how he didn't earn it and Triple H laid out Ric Flair. So we were all thinking that maybe we were going to get a program between these two, but boy were we ever wrong. On the first episode with Triple H as world champion, he was in four different segments throughout the show. And this becomes a theme throughout this video is the overuse of Triple H. I'm pretty sure if you looked at a raw creative meeting between 2002 and 2004, it would literally just say Triple H on the script. <laughs> Triple H's first challenger was RVD, who was a fan favorite. Mm -hmm. He was young, exciting, high-flying. He was a fan favorite on Raw. RVD was that guy. RVD 
was what Rey Mysterio was on SmackDown. Like, SmackDown, the heart of SmackDown was Rey Mysterio. We cannot deny that. Well, at one point, it was uh, Eddie DeGuerra, and then when he passed, it became more Rey Mysterio. But the heart of Raw was definitely RVD. That, uh, you, you can't refute that. He was the heart of Raw. In my opinion. He had everything. He won a fatal four-way match involving Jeff Hardy, Big Show, and Chris Jericho to face Triple H at Unforgiven. That match came, and a lot of people were hoping RVD would win, but that didn't happen. Yeah. Just as it looked like Ric Flair was about to screw over Triple H after being humiliated by him, Ric Flair aligned with the World Heavyweight Champion. This is an alliance that we'd see for the next few years. Ric Flair was out here telling people that Triple H was the greatest of all time. That this man possessed everything needed in a world champion. He was saying that Triple H was the new Ric Flair. After he was done with RVD, next up for Triple H was Kane. Mm -hmm. And brace yourself cause you guys knew this was coming. One of the worst and downright stupid angles in wrestling history. The Katie Vick storyline. Yeah. Triple H came out telling us that 10 years ago, Kane killed someone named Katie Vick. That Kane was a murderer. But who was Katie? Kane told us that Katie was just a friend, and Triple H went, No, she's not. And he asked Kane, Did you do it to her while she was alive or when she was yeah, dead? This is, what was he talking this, about? Well, this was a sick, sick fucking program they had i'm like bro why, why are we doing this i'm like what the fuck katie and kane had gotten drunk at a party and what happened after was a complete accident triple h was saying that this wasn't an accident and that kane was evil and he was demonic and at no mercy he would ruin kane's life and take away his intercontinental championship in a winner take all match and at that event triple h retained his world title but this feud wasn't over yet the next night on Raw, Triple H said that he had video evidence of Kane having intercourse with Katie Vick. So later in the night, Triple H shows a videotape of him butt naked in a thong, wearing a Kane mask, having sexual intercourse with a doll at a funeral home. He gets in the casket and he reenacts what Kane apparently did to Katie. And at the end of it, he's like, wow, I really did fuck your brains out, bro. Whose idea was it to run this? Making love to a dead person, you know, a, a female dead person when you're a guy is, and you're in this thong type thing. It was like, that is like high comedy if there ever is. Next week, Triple no. H came out and he was talking to mannequin Katie Vick and she was telling him that Kane had a small D. Hurricane was out here showing footage of Triple H having a sledgehammer removed from his ass. It was just wild. At the end of that night's Raw, it was a casket match between Triple H and Kane. And out of the casket came a returning Shawn Michaels to continue his feud with Triple H. For those that don't know, Triple H and Shawn Michaels were having a blood feud heading yes, into SummerSlam were. 2002 after great. Shawn Michaels returned from a back it injury. And it was at this point in 2000... That's one of the greater things that happened between this time period with Triple H. Tr HBK, Triple H, that blood feud... That's that's one of the things that made this his little reign of terror tolerable, in my opinion, because that feels so good. So good. 2002, where WWE began the build for the first mm -hmm. ever Elimination Chamber. It would be the world champion Triple H defending his title against Kane, easily Chris Jericho, the, Booker T, RVD. Easily one of the best hell, uh, Elimination Chambers. The first one was so goddamn good. D and Shawn Michaels. So goddamn Shawn good. Shawn Michaels took the win, and the redemption story for him was complete. Yep. Who did he pin? It was Triple H, what a noble man, putting over his best friend. Shawn Michaels held the title for about a month, defending it against RVD, before facing Triple H at Armageddon 2002. This match was a three stages of hell match, and at the end of the night, it was Triple H who would come out on top. It was around this time where the recruitment process began for Triple H and Ric Flair, for the group that would eventually be known as Evolution. Evolution. Ric Flair was scouting Batista and telling him that he possessed everything to be the best in the business. For Triple H, he was continuing his crusade against former WCW guys. The next one for him was Big Papa Pump, Scott Steiner. These guys were out here doing pose downs, push up contests, arm wrestling matches, just trying to one up each other and prove who the better man truly was. This was when there was a bidding war going on for Scott Steiner and how Raw attracted him to their brand was they promised him a world title match against Triple H. He got this match at Royal Rumble 2003. 
And when I say this match is garbage, I mean it. This match is garbage. They had the monster that was Scott Steiner and they put him in a match with Triple H while he was injured. Triple H retained and a small time later on the January 20th, 2003 episode of Raw, we were introduced to Evolution. Mm -hmm. Triple H's version of the Four Horsemen. Yep. You had Ric Flair, the legend of the past. Triple H, the star of today. And Randy Orton and Batista, the, the future, future of yep. the WWE. A group destined for success. For Triple H, he was destined to meet Scott Steiner again at No Way Out, where Triple H took the win once again. Mm -hmm. Now, it was WrestleMania season, and we had yet another infamous angle. You see, oh, this one, this is the one that will always boil my blood. Oh, oh, this angle. I don't care what no one says. This, if you're going to go this route, you're going to go this rogue on an angle. You're going to bring up some racial tension. You got to give the championship to Booker, bro. It, it only made sense for Booker to win that match. Oh my God. There was this guy named it. Booker T, who oh. was a former five time WCW five -time. champion. One of the best superstars to come out of the invasion angle. Yep. And he won a battle royal to face Triple H at WrestleMania for the World Heavyweight title. The whole story was about Booker T fighting from the bottom and earning his way to the top. A guy who was in jail, but he would put the past behind him and go from rags to riches. But what ended up happening instead? was this storyline took a downright racist turn. Yep. Triple H was telling Booker T that someone like you doesn't belong here. He was insinuating that a person of color like Booker T wasn't someone who belonged at the top of WWE. He was only here to entertain the masses. You had Triple H and Ric Flair telling Booker T to be their slave and that he was only here to crack jokes and make them laugh. So we were heading into WrestleMania 19 and the guy had just been humiliated but we'd gotten to know him a lot. So logic would have suggested that Booker T yes. would have overcame the villain Triple H and won the title. But Booker T lost after Triple H hit a pedigree and legitimately it felt like he took about four hours to pin him. This is a controversial one and one which almost everyone unanimously says that yes, Booker should have won this. They basically built this up as Booker, you're not deserving of being here and they played the race card only for him to go on and lose. Yeah. Did Booker T recover after this? Yeah, he did. But the problem with a lot of this reign is that guys who should have won at certain points didn't. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you guys are aware that there's times in pro wrestling where if you don't win when you're supposed to, you never recover. Bax, this is, I don't know how many times this has happened. If you... You got to strike while the iron is hot. That is a saying for a reason. If Booker T would have won that match, that would have made him, um, it would have made him a star. He would have beat the top guy on Raw. If you're going to give the belt back to Triple H at some point, you can. But it would have made him a star, a bigger star. Now, granted, when things went, he went over to SmackDown. He had the King Booker situation and it worked for him. But imagine if it would have happened when it was supposed to happen, when they should have booked it. It would have been a great moment. It would have been a great WrestleMania moment. Speaking of recovery, we had Kevin Nash recover from his quad injury, and he was back in the WWE, only to find out that his two best friends were caught in a heated feud. So he had to choose. Either he would side with Triple H or Shawn Michaels. And Triple H decided that he was sick of the crap, and he made the decision for Nash by hitting him with a low blow. This led to a six-man tag team match at Backlash, and at the end of it, it was Kevin Nash getting pinned by Triple H. And from here, Kevin Nash was on a mission to kill Triple H. They were brawling on the streets, Triple H was stealing trucks, and someone at the end of this would have their judgment day. At that event, Triple H retained his title by DQ, and a rematch followed at Bad Blood 2003. <laughs> this time, the thing was that not a single ref on Raw wanted to officiate this match because they thought it was dangerous being in the ring with Triple H. Of course, he gonna hit you with a sledgehammer, so of course. Triple <laughs> H. So Mick Foley was named guest ref and Triple H retained the world title. All right, nothing too controversial going on here. You know, he's not banging dolls or being racist, but something big was coming. One of the biggest moments in Raw history. But before we get there, 
Randy Orton made his return to the WWE after an injury, and three-fourths of Evolution was back together with Batista still injured. With Batista injured, Triple H decided to try to recruit Kane to join Evolution, but Kane went, nah, I'm not doing that. He had his sights set on the World Heavyweight title, and we got a mask versus title match. If Kane won, he'd be world champion. If Kane lost, he'd be forced to unmask. And it was the latter which ended up happening. Mm -hmm. Kane was forced to unmask and showed his face to the entire world. And Kane went off after this. Mm -hmm. He was burning JR. Hitting he went definitely rogue. I, I did enjoy this segment. <laughs> Nigga Kane was trying to murder people when he took his mask off. It was a cool little moment. I ain't gonna lie to you. Linda with tombstones and just creating hell on earth. That was twice in a matter of year where WWE did something weird with Kane. Yeah. Two times where probably he should have won the world title, yeah. but he didn't. And this comes back to the damage I was talking about earlier. Sometimes the obvious decision is the best one. You guys know that Grim Reaper knocking on the door meme? Well, that was basically Triple H in this time frame, mm -hmm. killing everyone from WCW. But that door would open again, and this time it was Goldberg. Goldberg's turn. Goldberg had debuted after WrestleMania, and he was tearing through everyone. And himself and Triple H were on a collision course for SummerSlam 03 in a singles match. But Triple H suffered a groin injury, and instead of the match being one-on-one, -on -one, WWE decided that they wanted Triple H to wrestle, so they changed it to an Elimination Chamber match so that Triple H would have to do minimal movements. This was where Triple H was wearing the biker shorts, and obviously now that he was injured, it would be a perfect time to drop the title. Yeah. Come SummerSlam 2003, it's Goldberg and Triple H as the last two, and somehow, some way after a sledgehammer shot, Triple H retained the world title. Yeah. You guys see how repetitive these match finishes are? Interference, DQ, pedigree, extremely long interval between pedigree and cover. It was a rinse and repeat cycle and he should have won it then. He should Goldberg should have won it then. Simple as that. But <laughs> he ended up winning it, but he didn't win it when he was supposed to. And even then he only had it for like one month. A huge criticism of this time frame was the lackluster matches. After Goldberg lost at SummerSlam, the two men met again at Unforgiven. This time, Goldberg took the win, which kind of made no sense. Like, you could have just had him win at SummerSlam. Thank you. But there it was, Goldberg was world champion, and now a bounty was placed on his head. See, Triple H was injured, so WWE decided that we won't have him compete. Instead, we'll run a storyline where Triple H puts a $100,000 bounty on Goldberg's head. So you had dudes trying to run down Goldberg with cars, but the person who claimed the bounty would be a returning Batista and Evolution was now complete. After suffering a loss to Goldberg at Survivor Series 03, Evolution ended Armageddon with all the raw gold. Batista and Flair were the tag champions, Randy Orton was the IC champion, and Triple H captured his third World Heavyweight Championship in just over a year. Mm -hmm. It was circle back season for WWE now, and they went back to the Michaels and Triple H feud for Royal Rumble 2004. Both dudes just had a full on bloodbath in a last man standing match. The match ended in a draw and both men were stretchered out of the arena. Definitely check this one out if you haven't. Fantastic on the match same too. night, Chris Benoit won the Royal Rumble and he was on SmackDown, so you'd think that he would go challenge for the WWE title. But he made his way over to Raw, and it looked like we were going to get Triple H versus Chris Benoit at WrestleMania for the world title. But before Daniel Bryan was out here making matches triple threats, it was Shawn Michaels who kicked Benoit in the face and signed the contract for WrestleMania 20. In his mind, he was the rightful number one contender because he didn't lose to Triple H. So Mania 20 comes and these three put on one of the best yep. WrestleMania matches ever. Definitely and it ends with match. Error 404 making Triple H tap out. <laughs> the fact he says Error 404. <laughs> That's crazy. You call him Error 404. But that was a, a beautiful moment to see him and uh, Eddie... Chris Benoit and Eddie like actually embrace each other in that moment because they both were champs. They both was at the top. It, that was a beautiful moment. And becoming the world heavyweight champion. Chris Benoit and Eddie Guerrero celebrate and they're ushering in a new era. Yeah. Following WrestleMania 20, Triple H was drafted to SmackDown, but he got traded back to Raw for Bubba, Devon, and Booker T. 
Now Triple H was the only member in Evolution without a championship, so he came out demanding to be put in the upcoming world title match at Backlash. So we were getting HBK vs Chris Benoit vs Triple H at Backlash. It was during this time where Triple H put over Shelton Benjamin in the main event of Raw and then again by countout the next week. And now Evolution was showing cracks. Triple H lost at Backlash, Batista and Flair lost their tag team titles to Edge and Benoit and it wasn't looking good. We had Triple H leave the world title scene and we pivoted back to Shawn Michaels versus Triple H one more time. Mm -hmm. These two were trying to kill each other. Shawn Michaels was out here getting suspended and mm. instead it was Kane challenging for the world heavyweight title even though Triple H was still main eventing. This is around the time where we got our introduction to Eugene. Who is Eugene you might ask? Well he was the special needs <sighs> nephew of Raw GM Eric Bischoff. <sighs> and who was Eugene's favorite wrestler? It was Triple H. So this dirty mastermind decided that he should take advantage of the disadvantaged and he tried to use Eugene. Yo, what the fuck was going on this, on Raw during this, this time? This These guys time. were playing musical chairs to determine title contenders. Eugene, though, went on to cost Triple H the world title at Vengeance and again during a 60-minute Iron Man match on Raw. So for SummerSlam, we had Triple H taking on Eugene where Triple H ended up winning. It was on that same night where Evolution member Randy Orton was taking on Benoit for the world title and Randy mm -hmm. took the win and became the youngest world champion in history. And the breakup of Evolution was underway. Yep. Thumbs up, thumbs down and Randy Orton was kicked out of Evolution. Triple H wanted the world heavyweight title but Orton just spat in his face and refused to give it back to him. And we got babyface Randy Orton. The two met at Unforgiven 2004 and Triple H ended Randy Orton's first world title reign. At Taboo Tuesday, Triple H had a successful defense against Shawn Michaels. Yo, you would swear this is Vince McMahon's creative mm -hmm. plan at this time. <laughs> and from here, it was Team Orton versus Team Triple H at Survivor Series. The winning team being able to be Raw GM for one show each. It was early November where we got our first glimpse of an upcoming feud between Batista and Triple H. Triple H leaves the locker room and Batista looks at the world title, signaling that he wanted what Triple H had. Mm -hmm. At Survivor Series though, Team Orton won with Randy Orton being the sole survivor. So Triple H was out here getting pissed and telling Batista that he was basically useless and not as good as he thought he was telling Batista that he had a million dollar body and a 10 cent brain. And this was good, this is good storytelling because you could tell they were building up for Batista to be the guy. He was threatening to replace him in evolution and then you had Ric Flair just trying to play peacemaker. Batista was laying out Triple H in the locker room but they were swerving us. Maybe Triple H thought that they were going too quick with this feud and they wanted to just let it burn slowly. On Raw, the main event was Triple H, Edge and Chris Benoit for the World Heavyweight title where Benoit tapped out Edge while his shoulders were pinned at the same time. Declared vacant and Triple H was out here crying and begging, looking as red as a tomato, <laughs> begging for his world title back. I am uh, the game. <laughs> and tonight, you will see me play my game. <laughs> like, bro, just shut the fuck up. We don't want to hear you. <laughs> During that time, we still sowed in seeds between Batista and Triple H. So Eric Bischoff decided that the vacant world title would be decided in an elimination chamber match at New Year's Revolution. Yo, you guys talk about Charlotte stat padding or this guy stat padding, Roman stat padding. Triple H is the inventor of stat mm -hmm. padding. At New Year's Revolution, Triple H pinned Randy Orton to win his fifth world title in four years. Why do you guys think that Triple H has the record for most Elimination Chamber wins? This dude was almost undefeatable in those. Yeah. But fear not, this reign is coming to an end. Randy Orton was out here snaking out Triple H, casting doubt in Batista's mind that he was being used and Batista slowly started to turn on Triple H and the reactions for Batista started to get louder. Mm -hmm. Triple H was costing Batista matches and telling him not to enter the Royal Rumble because he wanted to save his world title. But Batista went 
I like the idea of a Royal Rumble, so he entered it. So we come to Royal Rumble, and Triple H retains his world title, burying babyface Randy Orton. And at the end of the night, there were two people left in the 2005 Royal Rumble. Cena. Batista and John Cena. Two bona fide top tier stars for WWE in the immediate future. Cena and Batista both land at the same time. Vince comes out, tears both quads, <laughs> and we restart the match. That was funny. Vince comes out there to restart the match and tears both his quads. <laughs> so he's sitting down and says, restart the match. So they end up restarting it. That, that was a funny scene. He just tears both his quads. He's just sitting on the mat, giving orders. And Batista ends up winning. The story from here was, where will Batista go? Will he go to SmackDown or will he stay on Raw? Triple H was trying to get Batista ran over by a limousine pretending he was JBL, but Batista caught Triple H in the act. And then we got to that iconic moment in February. The thumbs up, thumbs mm -hmm. down, and Batista lays out Ric Flair and Triple H. He's going to WrestleMania 21, and he's challenging Triple H for the World Heavyweight Championship. And at Mania 21, in the main events, after a pretty whatever match, Batista had done it. He was the new World Heavyweight Champion, whatever, and the man. future was, generation I, was, was in I... full swing. Batista beat Triple H again at Vengeance and Backlash, mm -hmm. and the reign of terror was officially over. Thank sure, Triple H had reigns here and there, but nothing was as bad as this stretch from 2002 to 2005. So, was it really that bad? It was. It was really bad. I think I read somewhere that Vince McMahon saw that the Raw brand wasn't doing so hot, so he sent Pat Patterson on like a fact-finding mission and he came back to Vince and he was just like, yo, it's it's Triple H. He's not that big of a draw. People think he's boring. If you look at this reign in retrospect, the glaring issue is the stunting of people's momentum at yep. Triple H's expense. Like Goldberg, for example. Him winning was cool, but why didn't he just win a month earlier? Booker T, he should have won. Kane, that one's arguable, but you could say that he should have won. It was these guys' time, but they just didn't get it. It was also this weird thing where he was like, haha, I'm on the booking team. Austin's gone. Rock's gone. This is my show now. Mm -hmm. The formulaic 20 minute promos were absolutely abysmal. It's just shady if you really look at it. There's so much politics to uncover behind what was truly happening. SmackDown was out here flourishing. Well, Raw was a rinse and repeat pattern with Triple H. It was actually terrible. The good thing to come out of this reign of terror was we got a good feud between HBK and yep. Triple H, like Orton's initial emergence, and of course the big rub that Batista and later John Cena would get. I tortured myself by watching every segment, every match. Drop a like for all the pain that I entered I to make will, this man. video. But I want to hear from you guys. Do you I, guys I, think the reign of I terror was good? Or bad. I'm gonna give you a, a a like. I gotta give you a like, man, because you was uh you went through hell, bro. You you went through hell for us. I I'm not gonna lie to you, that is a, a chore I would not wanna do. But I definitely agree with a lot of his uh statements he made in this video. Triple H, even though there was a, a good feud and there was some good aspects that came out of that long period of him being at the top. It ultimately stunted a lot of people's growth when they needed it. Imagine if they would have gave the win to certain people when they needed to. How things would have been fresher. How things would have been on Monday Night Raw. But that's just my opinion. But comment down below. Let me know. Do you guys agree that Triple H between 2002 and 2005 really brought down Raw as an overall show? Because he kept... That Pretty much had, had the World Heavyweight Championship. He had it hostage. Or do you think from that time period, that was the uh, the best time for you? You enjoy Triple H being at the top of the card. <laughs> every, you know, every segment of every pay-per-view. If you guys enjoyed that from that time period, let me know. But I appreciate all the love and support. Road to 70K. Appreciate y'all kicking with me. See y'all on the next one. Peace.